introduction. That was very nice. Thank you. Um, let me just clear. Somebody's just done a little scribble on the screen, so I'm just going to clear it. Yeah, the drawing. There we go. Okay. Um, Afif, thank you for that very lovely introduction. And um, yes, just very briefly, as Afif said, I was working in the Maldives as the Director of Talent Development for the Seneva Group. And when I returned to the UK, I set up the business, the Daisy Gray Partnership. The purpose of our business really is to share the value of having a different perspective. So this is all about looking at the world through a different lens and not only ever looking at the world through your own eyes, but looking at it through the eyes of others. And that gives us a 360 view of the world and the different people in it. So culturally and from a communication perspective, having this broader view. That's what we focus on alongside leadership development and um, and team development and in addition to that guest uh, and customer service so that's it in a nutshell let me move us on Just bear with me for a second so today's subject something i'm really interested in and have been forever is the subject of emotional intelligence many years ago i had real issues that perhaps i wasn't intelligent enough because i didn't go to university and i didn't find studying in an academic sense very interesting or engaging however i discovered that emotional intelligence has not just as much value as the traditional IQ or academic intelligence, but actually more power when it comes to being successful for yourself and in your business. So I just want to share a little bit, a snapshot really, of the subject of emotional intelligence or EQ with you all today so that you can reap the benefits of this for your own success and the success of your businesses. And it's particularly relevant at the moment as we're going through some really challenging times and need to understand how to better manage ourselves and others and our relationships through the stress and the challenge that we're being presented with. So what better time than now to sharpen your saw and to gain the edge? Many of us find ourselves with a little time now to think about our future. This is a strange time and I find a lot of people are talking about their own personal development and their own personal growth right now. And yet what we often do in these moments is focus all of our attention on other people and other things that need to be prioritized. And what I'm urging you to do is to use this as an opportunity to think about you the luxury of some you time and thinking about what would help you to keep your sh your saw sharp. Now, some of you will have heard the story of sharpening your saw before, and it's a story about coming across a man in the woods who was trying to saw down a tree, and he'd been sawing and sawing for hours and hours and seemed to be getting nowhere. So the man said to him, "Hey, why don't you stop and sharpen your saw, and then you'll be able to cut down the tree more easily." And the guy said, I can't stop and sharpen my saw. I'm too busy sawing down this tree, which is just really a story about how we don't stop for long enough to ensure that we're really keeping ourselves sharp, that we're rested, that we're looking after ourselves physically, mentally, and from an education perspective, and actually thinking about how we use our own brains more effectively as part of that process. Now, in the chat, I'd really like you to share with me what you feel the most important attributes for a leader to have might be and what you think the most important attributes for a good team player might be. So just in the chat, what are the most important attributes for a leader? What are the most important attributes for a good team player? How would you describe those qualities? Give you a moment to put your thoughts in the chat. If you can't find the chat, it is down. You should find a little thing at the bottom that says little chat icon. OK, so we've got team spirit, being ambitious, effective communication. Very good. Visionary. Lovely. Relationships, empathy, inspiring, adaptive, able to lead and motivate. 
empathetic, show the way, passion, motivate, good listener. To be able to know that he or she is not always right. Thank you, Emma. That's brilliant. Understand the situation, engage, empathy and ability to lead, the ability to understand others, self-awareness. The leader should be able to successfully guide people towards achieving a goal. Fairness. Amazing. OK, loads of really great attributes and I'm going to hold those there in the chat and come back to them very soon. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Loads of good stuff. So let's move on to talk about what is emotional intelligence. If we consider the way our brains work, this model describes for us some of the systems that we use as a, on a daily basis as we go through life. So just to explain it to you in the briefest of terms, from a neuroscience perspective, what we see here, this part, this is the amygdala, the, the part that's labeled number three. This is our brain stem or our amygdala, which is our most basic brain. This is about fight, flight, keep ourselves alive. It's about survival, eating, sleeping, making sure that our species survives. Those things all exist within that part of our brain. It's very simple, but very effective. And a lot of what happens when our emotions are hijacked, we call it the amygdala hijack, is when that part of our brain kicks in to protect us against perceived danger. And that then spikes a reaction here in our middle brain, in our limbic system, which is where we hold our emotions. And this is sometimes called the mammalian brain, and it refers to our emotional responses. So when we feel fear or we feel as if we're under threat, we may then experience a a number of different emotions depending on the way we're wired I guess and finally the outer area the neocortex this is our rational brain this is the part of this is the thing that makes us different from every other animal on the planet because this is about rational thought decision making the intake and output of information how we plan and organize our lives and our days and all of that happens in this rational neocortex, this outer part of our brain. But as I said, what's interesting about all of this is that despite having this rational grown up adult brain, often that's hijacked by the stuff that's going on in part three and part two of our brain. So our amygdala hijacks us. We get overtaken by our emotions and then our rational brain goes out of the window. So emotional intelligence is about understanding that that's happening and knowing what to do about it. Essentially, EI or emotional intelligence is self-management. It's knowing what's happening and being able to manage yourself effectively. EQ is the measure of your emotional intelligence. So in case you hadn't come across those two phrases before, that's what we're looking at here. EI is emotional intelligence or self-management, EQ is the measure of your EI. Now, I'm going to launch a poll and I want you to tell me what you think the percentage of success is from IQ and from EQ. So, I'm going to launch this poll. I'm hoping you can see question one what can you all see question one can you just give me a little nod yes thanks elaine thank you so what percentage split of success comes from iq versus eq is it a 70 to 75 percent iq and 25 to 30 percent eq is it b 80 to 85 percent is iq and 15 to 20 is eq c 25 to 30% IQ, 70 to 75% EQ, and finally D, EQ 15 to 20% and IQ 80 to, sorry, IQ 15 to 20 and EQ 80 to 85. So what percentage success do you think comes from IQ and EQ? A couple of you, I think, have still got your microphones on. There's a little bit of background noise. So if you have, please pop yourself on mute just so that we can eliminate that background noise. Thank you so much. So 
so we've got four out of 68 people have voted so far oh yes we're starting to see a bit more happening okay keep it going what do you think is the percentage of success that comes from iq and eq what's the split Some people are responding in the chat. That's lovely. Thank you. When we get to 50% of you have voted, I will display the results. Have a few more. Okay, I'm happy with that. I'm going to end the poll now. So I'm going to give you just 10 seconds to vote if you haven't done so already. Great, let's see the results. So, 57% uh, of you have chosen C, which is that 25 to 30% of our success comes from IQ and 70 to 75% of our success comes from EQ. That's fantastic. I'm guessing that there are some very informed decisions in there and also maybe some lucky guesses. I'm not sure, but any, whichever way we look at it, that's really, really impressive because you're absolutely right. IQ determines only 20 to 25% of business success, whereas EQ determines between 75 and 80% of success. And if you look back at the words that you put in the chat to describe the attributes of a great leader or a good team player, none of those are about academic ability. The majority of the things that we look for in successful people are about their ability to motivate, to inspire, to have self-awareness, to understand others, to have empathy. That's what we look for and that's what we respond to in success and with successful people. And actually, it's really interesting. Um, there was, there's a guru whose name escapes me that I saw speak in India some years ago who described the difference between intellect and intelligence and said that intelligence was just learning something somebody else had already learnt and remembering that information. And intellect was the ability to have original thought, invent and create new ideas. And I thought that was fascinating. And I think that emotional intelligence or EQ is about being able to take what's in your head and make it work in the world. So the value of it is immense. And that means that we really need to dive in and see what it's all about and how we can make sure that we are as highly attuned in, in terms of our EQ as it's possible for us to be. So let's see how you shape up on the emotional intelligence scale. Grab yourself a piece of paper and a pen and I'd like you to rate to yourself on the five statements on the screen. So give yourself a rating of one being never or rarely is this true for me. Three is sometimes or inconsistently this is true for me. And five is this is always true for me. And question one um, or statement one is I always know what is making me feel unsettled or anxious. So if you always understand your own emotional responses and your own feelings, then you'd give yourself a five. If you sometimes you're not sure why you feel the way you feel, you'd give yourself a three. And if you never know why you're feeling anxious, you just feel anxious and you're not sure why, then you'd give yourself a one. And you do that for all five of those statements. 
going to give you two minutes to do that. Just two minutes. I'm just going to time you. Thank you, Adam, sharing on the chat. Love a bit of sharing. Thanks, Angelo. So if you take each of those five statements in turn and just on your piece of paper, just write one equals and then either one, three or five, depending on how you've scored yourself. Two, I can easily hide what mood or emotion I'm experiencing. Can people read you really easily? Do you have one of those faces that are really hard to show, really hard to hide if you're angry or upset or overexcited, or are you really good at hiding how you feel? Number three, are you able to motivate yourself to do the things that you don't really enjoy that much every single time, or do you sometimes find that difficult? Number four is about knowing why people might be responding the way they are to you. Like, what's the matter with that person? Why are they in such a bad mood? What have I done? Do you always know what's happened or do you sometimes just go, huh? I don't know. And finally, are you able to stop yourself from interrupting other people's conversations? When people are talking, do you, do you listen or do you go, oh, that happened to me, I've been there. Have you always got something to include and to add into the conversation? One more minute and then I'm going to move on. Thank you very much. These results coming in on the, on the chat, that's brilliant. I'm very honest. <laughs> okay, are we all right to move on? If you want to have a look at um, an emotional intelligence questionnaire, by the way, um, uh, Afif will be sharing your contact details with me, but you can also take my contact details at the end of this session and you can drop me an email and get in touch and I can send you a questionnaire which will give you um, an overview of your own levels of EQ. Okay, so emotional intelligence or EQ is the ability to recognize, understand and manage our own emotions but also to recognize, understand and influence the emotions of others. Now, the reason for that is that once we better understand ourselves, it's much easier for us to help other people to understand themselves. You know, there's a saying that I use all of the time in my trainings and in my coaching, and that is that the best way to learn is to teach. I've learned so much about myself in helping others to learn about themselves. So I think that it's very much a shared skill and that we have a duty as people that live on this planet together to help each other with this stuff. And so when you can support one another with emotional intelligence, it's a, it's a really very important gift to share. There are five elements of emotional intelligence as cited by Daniel Goleman in his book, Emotional Intelligence, which Conveniently, I have on my bookshelf just behind me. This is a fantastic book. And again, I can make sure that you've got uh, that. If you just email me, I can, I can share that with you. Such an interesting book. Uh, but what I'm going to share with you is just the highlights, really, from that book, which are these five key aspects that combine to develop us uh, from a, an emotional intelligence perspective. The first is about self-awareness, which is the ability to monitor your thoughts, to understand your own emotions and how they're affecting your behavior. So knowing how you're, what you're thinking and how you're feeling and then being able to translate that into the way that you're behaving and what that's making you do is really the first step towards being more emotionally intelligent. You know what you're feeling, you know why you're feeling it and whether or not it's helping you in your success or hurting you in your success. And you're also able to understand how others might be seeing you or how others might perceive you so that you're able to adjust your thoughts, your feelings and your actions and get the results that you need. 
So if you've ever been accused of not behaving in a way which is acceptable or helpful to yourself, this may be something that would help you in, in becoming more acceptable almost in your teams and for your in your workplace. It's about that monitoring your own thoughts, feelings and behaviour. Managing emotions then, if you remember back to my earlier example, managing emotions is about recognising when that has been the uh, amygdala hijack and your emotions have been overtaken and knowing what to do about it. So it's the ability to control or redirect any disruptive impulses and moods that you might have. You know, you, you hear the saying all the time, you can choose your mood. It's absolutely true. You can choose your mood. It is within your gift to choose your own mood. So if there's a situation which unsettles you or excites you, you're able to suspend judgment and to think before you act. And you can also help others to identify their emotions and to respond appropriately to them. The third on the list is motivating yourself. And this is a passion to work for reasons that go beyond money or status. It's the ability to pursue your goals with energy and persistence. And really, this is all about really knowing what you want. In a moment, I'm going to share with you some tips and some strategies for developing in each of these five areas, including this one. Empathy. I think most of us have always understood empathy on one level or another. For me, empathy is the ability to understand the emotional responses of other people and having the skill in retreating them according to their emotions. I'm going to share with you the three levels of empathy when we come on to that one in just a moment. And then finally, it's about social skill. This is proficiency in being able to manage relationships build networks, find common ground with others, and build rapport. So those are our five key areas of emotional intelligence. And I'm interested to know how you scored. So when we looked at those previous questions, I always know what's making me feel unsettled or anxious. That's about self-awareness. Are you self-aware enough to understand what might be making you feel the way you do? Do you recognize your personality type or your anxieties, your fears or your insecurities sufficiently to know why you're feeling the way you are? The second one, I can easily hide what mood or emotion I'm experiencing is about managing your emotions. So if you're angry, upset, overexcited, if you're able to be professional, and remain consistent in those moments, that shows enormous amounts of emotional intelligence around the managing emotions piece. If you're not able to hide your feelings, then that might be one to work on. I'm always able to motivate myself to do difficult tasks, is about motivation, as you might expect. I can usually understand why people are being difficult with me, is empathy. It's recognising that just because you don't do things a certain way doesn't mean that another person doesn't. So an example of that is when we say somebody's being oversensitive or that they're taking things too personally. You don't know that person well enough to make that judgment about them. And it's being able to place yourself in their shoes or feel the way that they might be feeling by tuning into them, not thinking only about yourself. And then I'm, I, I am able to stop myself from interrupting other people's conversations. It's social skill. All too often we spend a lot of our time waiting to talk rather than really listening to what somebody has to say. So how did you do? I'm going to ask you at the end to share with me which of these areas you really would like to focus on over the next sort of six to 12 months. But just interesting to see. Would you mind sharing in the chat if any of you have scored particularly high or particularly low in any of these areas or if there's anything that you find particularly um, a priority for you right now?
nobody wants to share oh three number three able to motivate, wanna, wanna <laughs> motivating yourself for difficult tasks yes that's tricky i find that difficult managing emotions and motivation thank you yes three it's interesting you're a one on number four okay that's interesting motivation brilliant look do you know it's interesting because i teach this stuff day in and day out and yet i know that the one thing that i still need to work on all of the time is number two i just really struggle to sh to hide what i think <laughs> and part of that is because i'm an extrovert and extroverts can't hide their feelings very well and that's fine if it's about being happy and excited but it's not so fine if i'm cross or i'm upset about something and it's all written all over my face and i can see a couple of you nodding so i think that you feel the same <laughs> so we've all got something we can work on nobody ever well hardly anybody ever scores five in all of them all right let's move on thank you lucy yeah with you there okay so if you scored yourself a five for any of those areas then that's a strength for you three is an opportunity to develop and one is a development priority and at the end i'm going to ask you to share with me any of your development priorities so let's have a little think about how we can get better in some of these areas um, and this is a lovely picture of the maldives i'm sharing with you now I wish I was there. I'm in the south coast of England, by the way, which is very sunny right now, unusually. We're actually having lovely, lovely weather. Um, and England's a nice place to be when the sun's shining, but that doesn't happen that often. Okay, so time to reflect on how we can get even better. Ah, uh, Dia, is that right? Have I said that correctly? I'm an extrovert and very much expressive, hard to manage my emotions. I feel your pain. It's a blessing and a curse. I think on the one hand, it's really lovely to be able to express what you're feeling in your face and in your expression and so forth. And, it's, and I think that emotional intelligence is recognising when that's not serving you well and learning when to try and just calm it down a bit, plaster on a smile even when you might not be feeling it. So how can we become better at self-awareness? Well, one of the ways is to understand your preferences. And I do masses of work with people all over the world on the subject of preferences and, the, and our brains and the way they're wired and what our personality types are and where we, why we are the way we are. And really understanding your preferences has huge value in two ways. One, because it means that you know what's going on and you don't feel like you're weird. You're not weird. It's just your, it's your personality. And the other is, that it means that you can recognize characteristics in other people and you can meet in the middle somewhere. So it's all about compromise, really. Get out of your comfort zone in order to develop more self-awareness. We are never really sure what we're capable of until we put ourselves out there and see what we can do. And so stretching yourself outside of your comfort zone and into your challenge zone is a really great way to become more self-aware as is our mantra here at the Daisy Gray Partnership, look at things from another perspective. You know, it's often about shifting your paradigm and changing the script that you're telling yourself about something that will help you to become more self-aware. Fill your blind spot with feedback. I'm gonna to come to that in just a second. And stop, think, and then respond. So I'm gonna share with you some strategies which will help with self-awareness and also with managing emotions, actually. And the first one I want to share with you is the Johari window, which you may or may not have seen before. Some of you will almost certainly have experienced the Johari window before and explored it before. For those of you who haven't seen it before, it was created by a guy called Joseph Luft and his colleague, Harry Ingram. And it's about thinking about ourselves as if we were this window with four panes. And the first pain, if you like, is our open self. So this is known to others. Other people know this about us. And it's also known to us. So we know this about ourselves. Others know it about us too. And that's all the obvious stuff. Age, gender, education, what you've got in your CV, where you're from, 
your religious beliefs and preferences and cultural background and what you like to eat and what you don't like to eat, all the stuff you happily share with people. Down here is what we call our hidden self. And the hidden self is unknown to other people, but known to us. So in here, we hide things like our insecurities, our fears, our secret passions, our hobbies, our interests, our biases, our judgments, all sorts of stuff sits in the hidden self. And it's, sometimes it needs to stay there because it's private. And sometimes we could share more about ourselves in order to build rapport and make connections with people. Over here is this blind spot I referred to just now. And the blind spot is a really interesting place because other people know about us, but we, it's something that other people know about us, but we don't know about us. And for me, this is what really the power comes from um, exploring this. The best way to uncover the blind spot is to ask for feedback from people. Ask them to tell you how they see you, how they perceive you, what they think you do well, what they think you could do better. And that helps you to uncover that blind spot. And then finally, the unknown self that neither you know anything about or other people know anything about is that step out of your comfort zone, try new things only through exploration and pushing yourself out of the comfort zone and into the challenge zone. Do we uncover that? So managing emotions then, in order to become better at this, we need to identify our triggers. What do I mean by that? I'm going to give you a couple of examples. There are a couple of things that really make me angry. And one of the things that makes me really angry is when people are patronising or condescending. When people speak down to me, for whatever reason that might be, that sets me on fire. I go bananas when that happens. So I recognize that that's one of my triggers and one of the things that I have to manage from an emotional perspective so that I don't let it overtake me. And what I remind myself of every time is that just because that's a value for me doesn't mean that they mean anything offensive by that behavior. And actually it may just be the way they were brought up or their culture or just because they're not very clever. And so I just have a little conversation with myself and try to manage my emotions around that trigger. Naming your emotions is so powerful. And the reason that it's so powerful is this. If you're feeling something and you take the time to ask yourself what you're feeling, the process of asking yourself that question engages your neocortex. The process of asking yourself the question makes your rational brain take back control. And in the process of taking control, it gives you back the ability to manage. So it's removing, it's a little bit like, I think of it as, say you're all in a car and you've got an adult in the driving seat, you've got a teenager in the passenger seat and you've got a child in the, in the back of the car. When your amygdala takes over, you've just put a two-year-old in the driving seat. They don't have the skills to drive the car or to manage your brain. When your emotions take over, the teenager's in the driving seat and the teenager is not really the most responsible driver. So when you ask yourself what emotion you're feeling, what you're doing is you're putting your adult back in the driving seat. You are re-engaging your rational brain and that rational brain helps you to manage by driving that car successfully to the conclusion that you need to reach. Don't make decisions in a bad mood or in a good mood. And I just know that there will be at least a quarter of the people on this webinar today who have made really terrible decisions because they've either been really excited and in a really good mood or in a really bad mood. And then later you've regretted those decisions. So just be cautious about making decisions when you're in a bad mood or a good mood. And just <laughs> thank you, Shangli. Thank you. That's absolutely right. So we've all done it. And you know what? Sometimes it's about buying things online for me. And then I think, why did I do that? I didn't need that. So yeah, buying things online falls into the good and bad decisions as well for me. 
check yourself, especially under stress. You know, we spend a lot of time looking after everybody else and managing everybody else's emotions and everybody else's emotional responses. We should also prioritize ourselves in that. So manage yourself, especially in times of stress. Ask yourself the question, hey, how are you feeling? Be your own best friend, be your own BFF and ask yourself how you're feeling and how you can better support you through any difficulties you might be experiencing. Here's a little model I want to share with you which helps you to think about this in another way. This is called the tier, the tier model and what it basically says is this. Thoughts create emotions, emotions trigger actions and actions will give us results. So a good thought such as I'm going to absolutely nail that presentation I'm delivering tomorrow creates an emotion which is an emotion of confidence, excitement, anticipation and happiness. That emotion triggers an action of being buoyed up, full of energy, full of engagement, really well prepared because you can't wait, you're excited to do something. The result, a great presentation. Alternatively, thinking, oh, I just know something's going to go wrong tomorrow. It's going to be terrible. People aren't going to like it. I'm not well prepared enough. Equals emotion, fear, insecurity, nervousness, and the action, shaking, difficulty to remember what you wanted to say, not presenting yourself in the best way you can. Result, a poor presentation. It's that simple. And it absolutely is true that you can think yourself happy or you can think yourself grumpy, the choice is yours. And the results will be the results that you have created by choosing the mood and the thought process. So the next time you feel your emotions taking over, stop, try to name the emotion, engage your neocortex, put your adult back in the driving seat and take control. Motivating yourself. Recognize what you want versus what you need. A lot of the time, we find it ourselves because we haven't really got a deep seated desire to do that thing. Now, there are always going to be things we have to do in life that we don't really enjoy. And what I try to do is connect them to something that I do enjoy so that they become partnered with something else and that I can't have this without having this. Um, so there's it's a big subject and one that perhaps we'll save for another day, but motivation is a fascinating subject and motivating ourselves and engaging with something are, um, is a process that you can learn. Break your goals down into manageable chunks. A lot of us find it much easier to be motivated to achieve something which has a quicker um, result. It's more gratifying more uh, sooner. So break your goals down into smaller, more manageable chunks and understand exactly what it is you're working towards. Have that big picture view, your longer term goal, if you like. Go back to why you set yourself this task in the first place. Why are you doing this again? Why, why, why? And you can ask yourself why five times to really get to the root of why you might be doing something like going to the gym. Why am I going to the gym again? Because I want to get fit. But why do I want to get fit? Because I have low energy. And why does it matter that I have low energy? Because I'm not performing at my best. And why does it matter that I'm not performing at my best? Because I want to succeed and be promoted and be successful. So then you are connecting yourself with the root motivator rather than it just being, I don't want to go to the gym today. And I'm sure there's a few of you who recognize that symptom. <laughs> so go for five. This is a trick that I learned quite recently and it's my favorite. If I really don't want to do something, I'll say, I'll just do it for five minutes and then I'll stop if I'm not enjoying myself. So I start doing something for five minutes and very, very rarely do I not keep going until it's done. I'm just tricking my own brain. I'm just convincing myself that it's just, just for five minutes. I'll just do the housework for five minutes and then I'll stop. But then I just do all of it. And you know it's always getting started that's the hardest part. Okay, I want to show this little story to you and some of us will, some of you will have seen this before, but it's about motivation really. So this is from a book called Timeless Simplicity by author John Lane. 
The rich industrialist was horrified to find the fisherman lying beside his boat, smoking a pipe. Why aren't you out fishing? asked the industrialist. Because I've caught enough fish for the day. Why don't you catch some more? What would I do with them? You could earn more money, then you could have more, a motor fitted to your boat, go into deeper waters and catch more fish. Then you'd have enough money to buy nylon nets. These would bring you more fish and more money. Soon you'd have enough money to own two boats, maybe even a fleet of boats. Then you'd be a rich man like me. What would I do then? Asked the fisherman. Then you could sit back and enjoy life, says the industrialist. What do you think I'm doing now? Says the fisherman. I love this story because it's about understanding what it is you're actually trying to achieve in your life. What is it that you actually want? And for you to truly be able to motivate yourself, you need to understand what your end goal is. What is it you're driving yourself towards? That's the key to staying motivated. Empathy. Change your perspective. In order to see things from another person's perspective, you have to change yours. It's a little like taking off your glasses and putting theirs on or stepping into their shoes and having a look at the world from their point of view, quite literally. So understanding others is a really important way to be able to demonstrate empathy. Explore the heart, not just the head. Many of us are fixed on quite logical and rational thought processes. But actually, empathy is more about the emotions that people experience. We've no idea what sits behind their reactions, their responses and their emotions. So we need to explore their heart and not just their head. What that looks like in real life is when somebody's unhappy about something, you actually ask them how they're feeling rather than what's happening. So instead of saying what's happening, you say, how are you feeling? Why are you feeling that way? Uh, so it's about the feelings walk in others' shoes, think about what their life might be like and why they might be reacting and responding in the way that they are and examine your own biases because we will often expect people to behave the same way that we might behave and that's not fair because we're all different. So ask better questions in order to understand people and be able to demonstrate true empathy. The three levels of empathy that I mentioned earlier are cognitive, which is logical, and it's knowing how, other person, how another person is feeling and what they might be thinking. So that's a very logical, cognitive form of empathy. But emotional is where you can actually feel that person's emotions as if they were your own. And not everybody finds this easy. Not everybody finds this easy. Depending on your personality type, you may have a preference for cognitive or for emotional empathy. They're equally valuable. If you can develop all three levels of empathy, then you really have nailed it. Compassionate is about understanding a person's predicament, feeling it with them, um, spontaneously being uh, able to help them. It's a balance of cognitive and emotional empathy. So this enables us to be compassionate and to assist somebody when they're having a tough time. And finally, social skill. So for social skill, it's all about asking open questions. It will really surprise most people to hear that I'm very shy in social circumstances. I love my work and I'm very happy in my professional capacity, but in social circumstances, I'm really shy. I don't know why, it's weird. So what I've discovered is that because I don't know how to talk about myself, I just feel awkward. And I always, I always think, why would anybody want to listen to me talking to, about myself? What I've learned to do is ask people questions about themselves instead, because that's much more interesting and it gets me off the hook. And the other thing I've noticed is that the more you ask people questions about themselves, the more we like each other because you learn more about them and they really enjoy having an opportunity to chat with you about what's happening in their worlds rather than it always being about you all the time. So encourage people to talk about themselves, offer compliments generously. Seriously, they're a free gift, a free gift for anyone, any time of the day, doesn't cost you a penny, and it's worth so much. A simple compliment about somebody, uh, the way they do something, the way they've said something, how they're looking that day, so, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Compliments are free gifts. 
you can read books about social skills i've got masses of them as you can probably see behind me i have a whole library of things that i've read over the years that have helped me and practice good manners you know what it's an old-fashioned skill having good manners but i think it counts for so much i have so much respect for people who demonstrate simple but good manners in life there's a guy i don't think he's alive anymore called dale carnegie who famously wrote a book called how to win friends and influence people and he says you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in them than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you there's a lesson for us all in there his top tips include become genuinely interested in people smile uh, that's another free gift by the way smiling at each other i love a smile it's the universal language of friendly remember our names are the sweetest and most important sound in any language speaking to somebody and calling them their name and speaking their name is a wonderful thing it breaks down so many barriers be a good listener encourage others to talk about themselves and if you feel yourself wandering concentrate on what they're saying pretend that they are just about to impart to you the most important piece of information imaginable and listen to everything they say because at some point they're going to share something with you that will be the difference between your relationship being a success and a failure and talk in terms of their interests what's interesting to them what do they love to do and why do they love to do it it's a great way to learn more about others and to create great relationships and rapport make others feel as if they are the most important person and do it sincerely and that really is all about being genuinely interested in people cultivating your curiosity about the people that we share this beautiful planet with so just as a reflection and a reminder iq determines 20 to 25 percent of business success but eq determines 75 to 80 percent of business success and it also equates to the difference between your personal success and your personal failure i have no doubt at all that the group of people that I've had the absolute pleasure of sharing this webinar with for the last hour will take small steps towards big changes in your future based on some of the things I've shared with you this afternoon. What I'd like to do is just ask you to do a little poll once more to tell me what you plan to work on for your own success this year. Um, the poll is uh, at the bottom of the poll that i'm sharing with you now i think it's share i'm sharing with you now so we've already done question one i'd like you to now answer question two which of the following do you plan to work on for your own success this year a self-awareness b managing motion c motivating yourself d empathy or e social skill if you could share with me which of those you're going to work on for yourself this year i'm just going to give you a minute to do that A says Mohammed Shippo. Thank you for sharing in the chat as well. Yeah, great. Just going to give it another minute, 45 seconds, and then I'll share the results. Thank you. Quite a mixture, a really big mixture. Looks as if there are quite a lot of people who struggle with the same problem I have about not being able to hide your emotions. <laughs> It's not always a bad thing, I think. I think it's fine to show your emotions when it's happy and positive. It's just a bit of an issue when you look really grumpy. 
Uh, I've put sunglasses on and big hat. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thank you to those of you who shared. So um, a huge proportion of people uh, are looking at managing their emotions more effectively, which I find very interesting. Let's all have a crack at that this year. Uh, but we've also got some self-awareness, motivating ourselves, empathy and social skill. I really appreciate you sharing that with me. Thank you so much. There we go. There's the results. OK, so. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Thank you for joining me here in my home on the south coast of the United Kingdom, where the sun is shining. And thank you for inviting me into your homes and into your workplaces. Um, if you want to get in touch, then either contact a thief or you can use any of the uh, contacts that you see on the screen before you. If you have questions for me, please pop them in the chat. I'll stay on the line until you've all gone. And I now would like to hand back to our host, uh, Afif, and, and a bow out and say thank you so much. Yes. Uh... Oh, that's great, uh, Sarah. Thank you very much. And I think it's uh, very enlightening what, what you have shared. And I uh, we already received some comments there that the models that you used to explain the emotional intelligence, which is always, I mean, it is an essential knowledge, essential skill that we need to build in ourselves. Uh, but at times it's hard to study and learn. There's so much knowledge. And I think in, in the shorter time that we had, you have actually guided us with uh, what it is really to uh, live the mindset of emotion. Today. So um, for all the participants, uh, if we, uh, you can post the questions here, uh, or we could actually take some questions. I'm not, uh, we, haven't, we did not get any questions right into the chat box. So please uh, uh, feel free to write the questions in the chat box. Um, if not, I, I have two questions to um, every, uh, sure. Sarah on behalf of other participants. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there is a, a question that has come from Muhammad Shafiu. He said, it's about anger. People at times say anger is inherited. What's your view? Mm. Um, anger is inherited. Well, that is interesting. I think that there are personality types that are more likely to respond in a particular way to difficult circumstances. The good news is that you can retrain your brain. So if you have a natural propensity, a natural in inclination towards anger, you can retrain your brain. But it is like there are there's a chance that it might be slightly inherited or at least form part of your personality. I think the thing to focus on is what you can do about it rather than giving it a label and saying this is inherited this is part of who I'm at who I am it's yeah. asking yourself what you can do okay very and good is managing it. yeah very good I see if there's any other question yes yeah, so there's one here will come through um Ahmad Saeed says uh, Sarah I appreciate if you could answer this question at the end of the session how hard we try to control of emotions sometimes, the emotions such as anger is too strong, we just forget to follow the steps you just mentioned. So how to avoid that? So I suppose yes. how to be more intentional. So if you could talk about that. For sure. The important thing to do is to re-engage your rational brain, your neocortex, your adult. And there are several techniques that you can use to do that. One of them is to count to 10. And I know it sounds like a very simple thing to do, but it's about re-engaging your rational brain. When your neocortex has been hijacked by your amygdala and your emotional responses from your limbic system, you have to re-engage your brain. And to do that, you have to do something that's rational and logical, like counting, breathe deeply, walk away from the situation, give yourself a moment. Sometimes it's about releasing your adrenaline by taking, having a running um, or some people take up things like boxing to manage their adrenaline levels. There are all sorts of ways for you to release some of that adrenaline, retake control of your, of your rational brain, the adult who is driving the, um, your emotional response. Yeah. Um, so count to 10, take a deep breath, walk away, 
Uh, some people will go and they will meditate, but that's generally a very, a very placid response. And actually, I think that to play, count and breathe is the best way to give yourself a chance to recover your rational thought. Yeah. Very good, Sarah. That's, that's, uh, that's a good point thing here. Uh, um, and uh, just one more question here from Nihal. What about having mood swings? What, what, what do you do to control that? How, how do you go about it? Um, mood swings can be a, can be the, can indicate that there's something going on that you need to fix. And that could be about your sleep patterns. It could be that you're not eating enough or regularly enough. Um, it could be about nutrition and what you are eating and what you're not eating so i would i would start by trying to understand what from a more rap, from a more holistic to use the h word perspective what's going on that might be causing you to have mood swings in the first place is this about sleep is it about food is it about whether or not you're getting enough exercise are you overworked are you stressed are you experiencing stress and if you're experiencing stress how are you managing that so we need to identify the root cause of mood swings because they are um, they are manageable once you understand what's causing them in the first place. We manage our mood getting some structure and some and, and schedule. We need some sort of structure in our lives so that we feel as if we're under control. Often some of our responses, anger, frustration, stress and mood swings are the result of not feeling as if we have control over our environment or the situation. And so we do whatever we can to regain control that helps us to manage our emotional state. Yeah, very good. Um, and there's a question here from Nishma. And why is uh, emotional intelligence important in leadership roles? What's your take on that? I think it's quite a generic question, but if you could uh, yeah, briefly yes, mention your tech, yeah. Of course. You can be the most well-qualified academic leader in any business, but if you can't talk to people, if you aren't able to manage your emotional responses, if you aren't able to empathize with others, motivate yourself, and create a sense of shared ownership for direction, then you will never truly achieve the ultimate as a leader which is to have people follow you because they want to and not because they have to so all of the soft skills that we discussed in the early part of this webinar when you shared with me the attributes of great leaders and great team members are indicators of what great leadership is about and that's largely about those abilities too. be self-aware manage your emotions motivate yourself show empathy and develop social skill through rapport and networking, creating connections with others. Yeah, uh, very good. And then we have another question that's come through here from Fawaz. How would you propose to push people who don't take things seriously without damaging the relationship you have with them? I think that that is um, more about giving them some feedback to help them to see that hidden pain in their Johari window and giving that feedback in a way which isn't harsh but is about helping them to understand themselves a little better in the way that they are perceived by other people. So there are ways of giving feedback which, um, which I'm very happy to share with anybody uh, in, if they want to get in touch. There, there's a particular model that we use which is about giving behavioural feedback to people who are um, are perhaps behaving in a way which we're not we're not necessarily comfortable with or we're not happy with um, and what you do there is you express the behavior the consequence of the behavior and how we need to move forward but you do it in a very grown-up way so that you don't offend that person yeah and uh, we have a question from Hama Shafi who says that um, can we identify if if uh, uh, someone is using a tactic to control one emotions rather than his or her on natural response. How do we identify? <laughs> Brilliant question. And the answer is it depends how good they are. So if they're very, very good at managing their own emotions and their own responses, then no, you probably won't be able to tell. But if they're still learning and practicing, then yeah, there might be some giveaways. <laughs> but I think that we always should applaud anyone who's at least trying to manage their emotions in that way. Yeah, 
I think we have the, the last question, uh, which actually was sent to me by one of the participants via uh, WhatsApp. Um, uh, said in, in the Johari Windows explanation, it was said that uh, extra, extroverts can easily express their emotions, and this is an advantage to explore their blind spot. How can introverts explore the blind spot and work on it more effectively? by asking for feedback and you'll do that in a slightly different way as an introvert so you'll want specifics um, you will ask for exactly what it is that you do and how it affects your performance and um, and you'll ask for details about what that looks like so if i was to say to somebody who was introverted you don't come across very well they would say what do you mean what does that look like? What does it sound like? Give me specifics. So introverts will ask for feedback in order to open up that blind spot. But they'll ask for specifics. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've got here uh, two more questions. So we'll, we'll take it and the thing is the last two questions. And uh, Dia, I, Dia Pascual, I think said, trauma plays a major role in lives. It hinders some improvement of um, the uh, EQ. How do we how do we deal with that? Well, that's a very difficult question. Well, it's not a difficult question, but it's a difficult situation, and and actually that falls into the category of counselling. So this is a much deeper issue than your day to day emotional intelligence. I will counter it, however, by saying that many of the people I know who have the most emotional intelligence are people who have experienced trauma, difficulties, tragedies and challenges in their lives and have used their emotional intelligence to help them to overcome that and have become stronger, more emotionally intelligent and more resilient people as a result. Yeah, very good. Now before I take the next uh, question, I would like all the participants to go uh, to the chat box and just write how much you enjoyed this webinar, listening to Sarah, uh, getting through these questions. And uh, so just, just uh, um, go to the chat box and, and uh, share a message of appreciation, um, you know, to Sarah to, uh, for, for this wonderful learning session. Uh, and also if you enjoyed this webinar, uh, you, 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 know, you could go to the chat box and, and you know, write you know, how happy you are that you are a part of listening to this. So please go ahead and write, write all the positive things that cross your mind by, by being in this session. Oh, so nice. The, Thank you, guys. Yeah, keep the messages coming. Keep the messages coming. Yeah. Yeah. While you're writing the message, I'll actually take the last uh, question here. Um, there's a, there's a question from, um, uh, getting through the, um, yeah. Uh, Mama Shafi said that obviously we're not experiencing EQ and to help us, could you share a tool or a method that we can measure the IQ as the EQ of a person or an employee? I guess referring to an employee, yeah. Measure the, I, the IQ, does that say? Uh, IQ was a uh, yeah. How yeah. we can measure the IQ? Um, yeah. No, it's, it's the short answer. I don't have a tool for measuring IQ, but there are tools available, and um, they are, and there's, a, and there's an organization called Mensa that you might have heard of that also yeah. helps you to understand your levels of IQ. But there are loads of tools, just Google it, IQ. Um, for EQ, yes, there are also loads of tools out there, some of them free on Google to measure your emotional intelligence. So Google it or get in touch, drop me an email um, or drop me a line. And I do have a emotional intelligence questionnaire that I would be happy to share with anybody who reaches out. Yeah. So uh, what I'll also do is I'll send all the participants email contacts to you, Sarah, and then you can I suppose, write an email and send that if your questionnaire, which perhaps can help. Uh, maybe a, you can suggest a reading link that will help them to get more, maybe more and more information. And the last question for the day, um, uh, we, we got a question from Mabruka. She said that sometimes superiors are afraid to speak for their gut feeling to express what they feel about something or a situation, how to overcome this. 
So this is when you're feeling something isn't quite right, but you aren't sure how to express it. Is that is that it? Yes, yes. They, 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 they know it's the right thing to do and the right thing to say, but sometimes they feel that, you know, they feel like, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't tell it to the team. Uh, the superiors, mm. I try to speak. Uh, yes. Or they hardly yes. It's really interesting. And a lot of this is down to your personality type and that you worry about how people are going to receive that feedback or that information. When the reality is that most people are quite happy to receive feedback. I certainly am. And I guess that most of you in this webinar would be too. Um, using assertive professional language to share a message with somebody that's not about, it's not driven by emotion or opinion is the most important thing. You have to be sure that what you're saying is based in fact and is not your opinion, your judgment or your bias that is playing its hand here. Um, again, it's a much bigger subject than I can answer easily um, in a minute or two, but uh, I'm always happy to help if you'd like more information about any of these subjects. Yeah, very good. Uh, so with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, uh, we have come to the end of our um, participation today in this webinar. We hope that uh, you found it very helpful. Um, obviously, very, very challenging times. Uh, you know, when we know that we will get through this, uh, definitely at one point, we just don't know when. I know things look a little bit uncertain at this time. Hopefully, with this knowledge that you got, we'll be able to uh, respond or react to some of the things that happens within our uh, organizations or within our community or within the culture that we live in. Um, uh, and I know many of you who join here are probably supervisors or team leaders or leaders of several organizations and um, perhaps you can go back and share this. Um, well, Sarah, the right to all of you, a uh, little note following this webinar and also with the question here um, and, and perhaps maybe a, a link of information that you can read. Um, please do stay tuned for other webinars by Mark on 1st of June. Um, just a couple of days we have another webinar where we'll be speaking specifically about how HR leaders can respond to pandemics and get their workplace ready for the future of work. Uh, and then on 8th of May, we will also have another panel discussion where we'll be speaking about uh, how to handle workplace wellness and well-being and uh, uh, you know, whom you can reach out for psychological support and counseling. Uh, obviously, the, the well-being and you know, the wellness has become an important part um, you know, more important, obviously, because of the current uh, pandemic situation. So stay well, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you very much once again for all of you joining this webinar. Uh, and once again, Sarah, thank you very much uh, for joining and, uh, you know, presenting us with this very important and timely topic. Um, and we're very uh, happy with the partnership that Mark and, uh, you know, and, and when we go with you. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you all. Have a great day ahead. Take Thank good you. care. Thank you. Bye.